Okay. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon, folks out there. Gene Panasanka here with Straight and Unfiltered coming right back to you. Uh, thanks for tuning in. If you're new to the channel, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button and hopefully going to like the, the interview. I have a great treat for you. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce to you Mr. Thomas Kajer, who is a founder and CEO of CN Eximus, a deal-driven enterprise focused on international trade services and technology. Uh, Thomas Kajer had previously published uh, his book, actually just came out recently, a couple of months back, Memoirs uh, <clears throat> of a Trade uh, Facilitator, The World Was My Oyster. A fascinating read, uh, truly uh, so much fun and wealth of information. It details his extensive experience of working in South Eastern Asia and Pacific Rim countries. So Thomas, again, I know we've been trying to line up this, uh, this video for quite some time, so glad to see you here. Welcome to the channel. Oh, thank you, Gene, for the introduction. Sincerely appreciate it. Uh, I should have brought my own book. Don't well, <laughs> I got it here with your wonderful autograph. So again, I, I truly appreciate, you know, lots of fun, uh, absolutely incredible experiences, you know, described here. So please take it away. Originally, you're from Long Island, just for the audience, Long Island, New York, and now residing happily um, in a wonderful state of Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> you said Wonderful state of Kentucky. Oh, thank you. Even though I have my hearing aids in, Gene, it's it's difficult for for me. But take, Kentucky, take, take it away, Thomas. Uh, yeah, take very, it away. Yeah, <laughs> very much. My right. son's here, as you well know. He's retired uh, from the U.S. Navy. Purchases uh, a farm from his in-laws. And, and thank you for your service for that, yeah, Thomas. You yeah, and the family, uh, Alex. I mean, you served, you know, years, decades in the in the U.S. Navy, and, and right now going through the, you know, holiday weekend, the uh, Memorial Day weekend. Uh, we salute all those fallen, you know, who fought, uh, you know, for our freedoms here in the United States. So we salute yeah, you all, and thank you so much for your service and your family. You. Yeah. And a salute to you too. God bless. <laughs> Amen. All right. Where Where would you like to start? Well, anywhere you want to start. I mean, it's it just so much stuff. I mean, we, we could probably do a 10-hour long interview, but I know you're pressed for time on this holiday weekend, so let, let's just dive right into it. Okay. Um, basically, I, I, uh, I'll start with the reason for writing the book was that I, um, I think I had mentioned to several people that uh, to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. Uh, what is meant by that is that my experience going overseas for 26 years trying to uh, facilitate trade between China and uh, the U.S. or the U.S. and China, the situation was that the U.S. companies would hire me and I would bring the products over, so forth and so on. Wasn't as successful as I thought that it would be, even though I had lots of support there. So I thought that by writing this book, I would be able to, uh, let's say, subsidize <laughs> myself in my retirement years. Yeah. Um, how this uh, whole thing got started actually by accident. I met a, uh, uh, actually, uh, what happened there? The, the um, uh, cleaners, the dry cleaners down, down the road from where we live, right. they sold, the Italian family sold to, a Chinese family, and I became friendly there with with the people, the owner and her partner. Her partner, Sai Pei Sao, uh, was a kung fu martial artist. Right. Um, very powerful guy. Two handstands with two fingers. I met uh, prior to all of this. I had met a an individual, and we had served together. And he had opened up a Taekwondo studio. From there, he attracted some of his other friends, so forth and so on. So I was reliving my youth. He happened to, Sai Pei Sao happened to see me in the, uh, at the dojo. And when I came in one time, he, uh, it became a competition between he and myself. To shorten up the story a little bit, um, Hui Xi and Wong's, nephew came uh, to visit. Um, in the, in the, uh, <clears throat> I introduced him as a doctor. 
Right. As as time went on, she said to ask me if I could help him. Now, how would I be able to help this individual create a get a position here in the United States? Even though I worked at that time for Health and Hospital Corporation, I had lots of uh, uh, lots of connections. But who no is yeah. a foreigner from China coming here? Okay, so I asked for a CV. I gave the CV to my wife. Uh, that's a that's a resume for the American audience. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, for to, to check for the med medical criteria. Now I was amazed by the the number of topics that he had written about in his CV, and I, I turned it over to Vivian, uh, my wife, to to review. She says, you know, the fellow's only what I think 24, 25 years of age. And he Vivian, says, just for the audience, Thomas, Vivian is in the healthcare industry, correct? Oh, yeah, v Vivian's in malpractice insurance. Uh, oh, but he has medical background. Yeah, yeah she, her medical uh, background is par excellence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so she reviewed it and she said to him, geez, he's only 25 years of old, uh, age, and he says that he's participated in seven, 750 uh, uh, let's say uh, cranial operations, you know, right. something to do with the, with the brain. Um, she says, you know, it's hard to believe. So I invited him over to the house, Hui Xian and uh, Wen Chong Huang, and we had a conversation. I said, you know, Wen Chong, I said, look, I said, I can introduce you, but you're 25 years of age. A brain surgeon here in the United States is uh, maybe 35, 45 years of age right. and so forth and so on. I said, you far exceed what <laughs> the normal doctor does here in the US. Right. So he explained his situation. Uh, and I started to think about, you know, how am I going to introduce this person? So it just so happened I was transferred to another hospital and I had done a lot of work for uh, this this particular doctor, and he he happened he happened to be I, I believe he was Japanese, so I gave him the uh, the uh, Wen Chong's uh, CV, and he introduced he he uh, the, my my uh, Japanese doctor friend introduced Wen Chong to um, oh geez I forgot the guy's name he uh, you know why uh, is Dr. Wise. Oh, Wise Young. Right. Oh, Not wise. I, I have my partner here. <laughs> <laughs> my, my extended memory. Yeah. He introduced, uh, my doctor friend introduced Wen Chung's CV to Dr. Wise Young. Dr. Wise Young is world renowned right. in spinal cord surgery. And he accepted <laughs> Wen Chung as his director of spinal research. I thought, oh my God. <laughs> so one thing leads to another and everything was done through friendship. Wen Chong introduced me to someone else, which was unbeknownst to me. He knew my schedule when I was in the city. Uh, 1313 Mott Street, I would have breakfast there at times, sometimes lunch, so forth and so on. And along the way, uh, I meet this gentleman and uh, there was only one seat available. Now, I don't know if it was prearranged or not. I'm not going to go right. into that. But So the waiter sat me down there, and I ordered my uh, standard order, three precious ingredients. Right. And so the, uh, my table mate, he, he in turn starts a conversation. And I, now he's well-dressed, suit, tie, so forth and so on. I'm saying, you know, this is odd. I said, ordinarily, you know, uh, Asians are not that outgoing. Right. So one thing led to another. To shorten up the story, um, I became an advisor for his TCM company. The right. TCM, to traditional Chinese medicine company, in turn, that he, he established in uh, New York City and Long Island City, was for right. the registration of Chinese, uh, traditional Chinese products here. That's, that's an entire... Uh, different industry, but unique and quite an education uh, that I, re I received there. 
And at that same time, let's see, I'm, I'm progressing, I'm fast forwarding. Um, uh, the Dietary Supplement Act was being introduced. 1991, I guess, right? It was a bipartisan act, act uh, when uh, senators on both ends of the aisles, they made a uh, proposal of the bill that was actually signed into law in 1991 and that pertained to dietary supplements. Am I correct, oh, Thomas? Thank you for the assist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, it's, it's great. Well, uh, <clears throat> Harkins and... Uh, <clears throat> oh, geez, I forgot his name. I don't believe it. He, he introduced it. Bill Clinton signed it. And suddenly, uh, I don't want to use the fellow's first name. Uh, Wu said to me, he said, right. do something about this. I said, maybe do something about this? He said, yeah, we, 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 this is an opening. He says, we'll look for new products. Right. So uh, I was looking for new products, and I, I, I came across Stevia. Stevia uh, is like 150 to 400 times sweeter than sugar. That's right. Yeah, and it's hundreds, hundreds of times as sweet as sugar. <laughs> that's pretty. That's pretty intense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's a South American product. The Japanese had it. Right. They were um, processing it. And they were using it in their products. This right. is oh, geez, this is a great for us. You know? So I contacted a, I think it was a Peruvian product, but I, I may be maybe wrong. I contacted the people and they said, sure. And they, lo and behold, I find out that here in the US, it's banned. I said, oh, geez, banned. And they said, well, you can import it but you have to import it in five to 10 pound pack, uh, boxes and you can't pack it. Later, I found out that you can't put it in a small pack. Well, fast forwarding. But who was regulating them, Thomas? Was it FDA who was regulating the dietary supplements? You're, you're gonna open up a whole bandwidth here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a whole bandwidth right. is to, uh, uh, let's say the FDA, the NIH, uh, FDA, the NIH, CDC. Okay. Has... So it's the whole spectrum of uh, entities and agencies that had to regulate that, that those kind of supplements. That's what you're saying. It was highly regulated. Yeah. We, received a, we received a, a letter uh, stating, in effect, that uh, uh, we could not sell it. That's that's. That's being that's being gentle, so to speak. Okay. Um, the FDA, in turn, let's see if I have that. No, the NIH, I believe, does the research and development. The FDA does the marketing, and the CDC does the dis the distribution. Okay, and there's a high uh, there's a there's such a connection between big pharma. And the three organizations. Yeah. Right. We're, we're not going to go into depth on that relationship, but I would like you to expand, Thomas, on how you have been able to successfully and uh, so expeditiously, if you will, launch the business on, on this end of the spectrum. And uh, that resulted in your multiple and extensive trips to Southeast Asia. I'm sure that the audience would love to hear about that. Okay. Just wait once. He wants to know how you were able to launch and about your trips back and forth. Oh, okay. kind of trips back and forth? Not, not getting into Oh, not, a, not in the political atmosphere. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I was able to secure 60, 60 uh, dietary supplement products, which I took to, to the night, uh, several trade shows. There was right. anywhere from night and 1996, 99, 98, so forth and so on, 98, 99, 2000. Well, uh, in certain cases, these, the products were basically successful, but what happens is that there's only, a product life is three to five years. That's right. right. Okay. So during the same period of time, I'll, I'll fast forward instead of within, in, in lieu of the 
uh, trials and tribulations of trying to <laughs> enter and get uh, uh, clinical trials for some of these things here. Well, during that interim period, I became a, uh, an advisor, one of 12 for the Department of Commerce with the US-China housing, uh, housing Initiative. With that, that was a whirlwind tour that I was on uh, right and I was in, let's see, a whirlwind tour. I was in uh, China for the 50th anniversary. Right. And forgetting about the military parade, if you saw the, the, the background, the side streets filled with all of the, uh, let's say, major organizations and schools and things of this nature, when all of this, I just think of New York City, you have Fifth Avenue. And all of the side seats leading into Fifth Avenue, you have thousands of people on, on each side of the street. Right. Each one of them is carrying a small packet. And as they're progressing to Tiananmen Square, the packets are opening. And once they're in, in Tiananmen Square, you see this red, uh, you know, flower uh, garden just, uh, above the people's head with the calligraphy in yellow. It's a beautiful e execution. All right, after that, we go back to the hotel and I'm off to, uh, let's see, with Hainan, Guangzhou, Hong Kong, Yantai, Yongmingyong, Let's see. Well, Macau was one of the areas that you visited as well. Macau, obviously, the former Portuguese colony that was established all the way back in the 16th century, okay. that actually served as a major trading trading center, you know, for Europe, you know, China, Japan, and the whole Southeast yeah. Asia. Correct? Yeah, uh, uh, Macau. Macau has an interesting uh, history. It's uh, it was founded. And it was the first European uh, enclave founded by Portuguese, the, yes. the uh, Portuguese. And from there, it developed. The, Portu the Portuguese, I could say, they were basically not warlike. Okay, they developed the island. The Jesuits, in turn, you know, went along with their, uh, uh, let's say, uh, development of Christianity, so forth and so on. But it was well accepted. Macau is is a is a beautiful place to to uh, uh, to visit. I mean, it's spectacular. The buildings are spectacular. The food is fantastic. In order to get to Macau, you would take a hydrofoil from Hong Kong, right? Uh, it's pure pure seven or something of this nature. Yeah. Uh, the yeah, pure. I, I, I'm pretty sure it was uh, Pier Seven, but in any, any event, that's a fascinating ride. Um, and let's see, uh, that was after some trade shows. I'm trying to, you know, trying to collect my thoughts, which sure. sometimes my thoughts wander, mm -hmm. as you know. <laughs> that's why I'm lucky that, that that the audience should be fortunate to have your book. Where everything is nicely organized chronologically and yeah, fascinating stuff. So, uh, there they uh, to return, it's about an hour trip. It's fascinating going to hydrofoil. So, I would go to this uh, Japanese restaurant for takeout to eat on, uh, to, to take on board to the hydrofoil. Now, they have service on the hydrofoil and the food is very good, but I had the partiality. So, our group would go back and forth each time I would stay at the, uh, I think it was the Renaissance Harbor Hotel. That's nice. And that Harbor Hotel is not far from the peninsula. Right. Now, the Peninsula Ho Hotel has a lot of history. That goes back uh, to the 1800s, I think. That's uh, an iconic name, definitely, out there. Yeah, it's... Uh, Yes, it is an iconic name. Now, I what I found fascinating was <clears throat> the fact that Ernest Hemingway would stay uh, 
Oh, I forgot there's an island across from, uh, I forgot the name of the island, but it's close, it's not too far from, uh, from uh, uh, Hong Kong itself. It's a separate island, an exclusive resort area. Right. Uh, eventually during our conversation, I'll think of the name of it. <laughs> um, uh, Ernest would stay on the island and then eventually drift over to the peninsula. Now, I felt, you know, uh, very, uh, yeah, let's say, outgoing one day. And I decided, you know, what I'll do is I'll, I'll stay at the peninsula for one night. Right. Well, uh, my pocketbook wouldn't, couldn't afford the, the peninsula. <laughs> so <laughs> no, it was a walk, a walk through and uh, conversations with a lot of the, uh, let's say, the major D's and some of the other people that were there, the, right. the full-time attendees. And each one of them at that time was well-versed in the history. And it was really fascinating. And if anyone really wants to have some, some form of, uh, do some form of exploration in right. Hong Kong, I would go to the peninsula, uh, provided your pocketbook can afford it. <laughs> Or, or stay at the Renaissance Hotel. In the right. Renaissance, you, uh, let's see, you, the Renaissance, you would go to Salisbury and to, I think it's Pier, Pier 7 for the hydrofoil, and then go to, to, to uh, Macau. And it's an enjoyable ride, so forth and so on. There are a lot of other hotels in in uh, Hong Kong itself, the food is fascinating. It's basically Cantonese. There's a lot of Japanese restaurants. They have Cantonese, Taiwanese, any any type of dish that you would want. Very colorful. From there, oh, let's see. Yantai was the, the a, a port city. Uh, that's very fascinating, especially when you're on the seafront. And you have, you, you, uh, let's see, aisles of, of uh, fish in containers. Um, I don't know if that's the correct way of expressing it, but you can walk down the aisle and see a group of fish, you know, whatever, whatever your desire are, octopus, you know, clams, oysters, codfish, so forth and so on, in these uh, containers. Right, they would scoop it out, prepare the meal for you, so forth and so on. And you could sit, it's uh, on the beachfront, but they had little, like, uh, little dining areas of 25 people. Yeah, there was about 25 people. And, uh, you know, you have the large table with the lazy Susan and so forth and so on. Fascinating experience. Um, let's see, I'm, I'm trying to think. Oh, Xi'an, beautiful. With the oh, that's that's, that's mainland. Uh, isn't it uh, what used to be an ancient capital of China? Or that, 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 that's, that's correct. Smack in the middle, yeah. It, yeah, it, just, yeah, it, it, exactly. This uh, uh, Wang Fei, I think was the fellow's name. He was the, uh, he was digging a well. Right. He found all these the little artifacts, so forth and so on. Terracotta, the Terracotta Warriors. Terracotta Warriors. Oh, Terracotta Warriors, yes. Of the, uh, uh, and which we, they, they turned over these findings to, to the government, and the government said, oh, you know, this is from what, whatever period. They yeah. continued the excavation. Now, that, that excavation turned into uh, the Chichan uh, Terracotta. Uh, warriors, and it's a massive excav excavation, and all of the soldiers in the terracotta soldiers, right. their facial expressions are the exact facial expressions of the individual that was in the army. But they're all different. Yeah, it's not like and a everyone copycat replica. Yeah, the coloring so and the spears and the uh, <coughs> excuse me chariots, so forth and so on. It's all on display. When we, at the time that I got there, uh, I, I left, I think I left Kuei Lin. 
Oh, the Legion Cruise. You're kind of going the Legion Cruise. <laughs> Let's hear about that. Yeah, and uh, and that's that's uh, that's amazing. Then work your way over to 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 Weiling. From Weiling, you go to Xi'an. But <clears throat> uh, we left the hotel, and you walk down this let's say wide open space with all of the kiosks so on the left and the right and some in the center islands. <clears throat> At that time, you had uh, access to almost anything from Panasonic, you know, radio, TVs, things of this nature. Then what was most impressive was you, you can get uh, deer skins, bear skins, you can buy the claws, you can buy <laughs> whatever you wanted. You know, the problem would be how to get it out of the country <laughs> and bring it here to the United States. Carpet, silk carpeting, uh, a lot of merchants there and all reasonably priced. Right. Uh, I don't know about today, but at that time, well, again, yeah, we're talking about decades back where very few foreigners like Americans were visiting, not just mainland China per se, but Xi'an, it's smack in the middle of the country. So very few Americans would venture that far away from, say, Beijing well, and Shanghai. Yeah. You, you don't think that they would? I, I, you know, not, I don't... not in the numbers we have been seeing in the last few years. That was pre-COVID, obviously. Pre-COVID. Oh, no. pre pre-COVID. Now, uh, in my estimation, it's well worth the trip. If you want, I would venture into uh, Mongolia or Inner Mongolia. I was there. Yeah, let's speak about Inner Mon Mongolia. You had some fascinating experience in, in that part of, uh, of the world. So you want to talk oh. about Mongolia? <laughs> my, Mongolia... Uh, inner, inner Mongolia, Mongolia, they're almost basically the same in their, in their attitude. Right. Okay. I was there for the, for the Tono. That was for the celebration of their, uh, uh, let's say, freedom or their uh, getting their, receiving their independence. The word Tono actually means roof. So right. when you're, when you're in, in, <coughs> It's my sinus, Gene. I'm sorry. No trouble. When you're in the gur or the yurt, you have this four or five posted, four four post circular dome, and all of the uh, I'll call them rafters coming down. Right. I forgot the name, but they but it's known as a tono, and that basically is the <clears throat> covering. Uh, protection for the yurt or the the gar or the same, and it may, it's uh, for uh, protecting Inner Mongolia or the Mongolians. Now the other facet, uh, the weather conditions there are almost identical to uh, Arizona, hot and dry, and I don't know how these people put on the display that they did in their full garb. When I say full garb, they have silk robes that will go from <clears throat> top to the bottom, maybe six inches or eight, 12 inches above their, uh, their heels. And they would have leather boots that go up almost knee high. And they're riding these horses and these horses are much smaller than the the, the uh, average horse that we're accustomed to, the gate yeah, yeah. Is, the gate is a killer. <laughs> right, I, I've been bounced around like whatever, uh, and I like horseback riding. Right, I did until this experience. Oh my god! <laughs> so there they are in full regalia, and they have their bows and arrows, and they're going underneath the horse's neck, and they're shooting at these targets. They're. Uh, let's say turning around and the horse is riding forward, they're facing back and they're shooting at these targets on the either side. I said, oh my God, <laughs> what, what a display. But what I found, the display was exciting, but the heat, I, I, I don't know how these people stayed uh, without getting uh, 
dehydrated, so to speak. Yeah, and when you speak about that part of the world, I mean, it's worth uh, pointing out to the audience that the temperature swings between, you know, the the summertime and the wintertime are, are just oh. dramatic. And uh, and it's just fascinating, as you said, how, how those people living really in the middle of the uh, of, of the nature, you know, I mean, how they can stay uh, th those kind of swings, you know, from bitter cold to, you know, pretty hot during the day. Oh. Yeah. Pretty oh. amazing. They're, they're very, uh, they're a hardy breed, and they're all nomadic. Yeah. At one time, I was trying to bring power plants over over there uh, <clears throat> from a friend of mine <clears throat> with James Yip, who's mentioned in the book. <clears throat> He's a professor for uh, the London School of Commerce or Economics. Right. And uh, uh, Peter, uh, he, Peter McGee, uh, and myself. Uh, we weren't there at the same time. But the, the issue was, how do you uh, change the culture from a nomadic culture, excuse me, to living in the city life? Right. In the city life, now they're still burning their garbage outside their, their gar, <laughs> which is outside, let's say, uh, Ula Batar. Okay. <clears throat> Ula Batar. One bar of the capital, yeah. The capital. The capital is beautiful, okay, but the <clears throat> but the girls are outside. So <clears throat> let's say during one period of time the girls are there, then they move off, and they're bringing all of their sheep and their cattle onto another area. And at that time, I was also not only the power plants, I was also trying to promote animal husbandry, yeah, which was uh, how do you. Uh, find an animal that is complementary to the, the 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 climatic conditions, the fast change that you were just uh, mentioning. You know, from hot to cold. Uh, where did we end up? I think I ended up in uh, Haiti or Jamaica with their cattle, and then some from uh, Ireland. Uh, uh, somewhere in there, but the, because they 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 were I, I, I forgot the name of the cattle. They 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 were quite hairy beasts. Yeah, they were. <laughs> but it turned out that they were looking for. I was being mined for information, and that's that's the part that I, I can't say I found upsetting. But after receiving, oh here here we go. After receiving my export trade certificate of review, which had allowed me to bring all products and services from the United States to, to China or reverse from China to <clears throat> from China to the United States, uh, a lot of people considered me uh, to be uh, a spy or an <laughs> industrial spy, so to speak. So both sides used me. Now, I'll give you a perfect example. We'll move from, oh, you know, I, I just I just had a flash and we're trying to think. Uh, have you ever been to Lake Baikal? That's yeah. in, in, in Russia, by, not too far from Chita? Oh, Baikal, Baikal. Oh, well, Baikal. Yeah, I, yeah. As you know well, I grew up in Ukraine and uh, anyone who knows me longer than 30 seconds, they know <laughs> that I, I'm Ukrainian. But yeah, my extensive traveling before I had a chance to actually move to the U.S. Yeah, I've been to Baikal a couple of times. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a fascinating place. Yeah, very, very different uh, ecosystem. Very it's, unique, uh, you know, to anything else, you know, out there. Yeah. It's the deepest lake in the world, as far as I, uh, I know. I had an opportunity to ra try to raise funding for an individual a producer here in the United right. States. Um, <clears throat> And uh, it turns out that oh, I also had an opportunity with, uh, uh, I can't think of the martial artist, he's now in Russia, Stephen Segal. Well, okay. uh, to introduce you know, him. I, I mean, this is disgusting. I was absolutely outraged when I heard uh, in the news that he actually accepted Russian citizenship. To me, it's disgusting. It, it is the most unpa unpatriotic thing for any American, and especially supporting that brutal, you know, uh, criminal. Uh, regime of, of uh, Putin, well, you know, and, and Russian terrorists. So that, that's disgusting. But anyway, Thomas, I mean, we can speak for, like I said, we, we can do like 10 hour nonstop, 
interview. Unfortunately, we are, you know, pressed for time. So we're over. Uh, uh, well, we, we still have a couple of minutes. I'll give you, you know, like, like a couple of minutes to wrap up the conversation. But the book itself, again, The Memoirs of a Trade Facilitator, The World Was My Oyster by Thomas Kajer. That's something that's very much recommended to anyone who cares about, uh, you know, international traveling, international trading. And I'm sure that uh, they're going to enjoy reading it as much as I did. <laughs> the, the information there is... Uh is well worthwhile. You can purchase the book through Barnes, uh, I'm going into an advertising book, <laughs> from Barnes and Noble on ebook for eight, on nine dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I, I highly recommend it for anyone that travels there. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Hey, this, this was the fastest 40 minutes of my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, Five decades compressed into 40 minutes. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> um, okay. Thomas, Gee, Thomas, great. It's a pleasure. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Ple pleasure uh, and honor is always mine. Thank you so much. God bless you and the family. Thank you all again for your service and the contribution to the great United States of America, folks. Uh, <laughs> and to our viewers and listeners, hopefully, folks, you enjoyed this uh, fascinating conversation. Again, I'm urging you to take a look at the book, and I hope you're going to enjoy it as much as I did. Folks, thank okay. you very much. Until the next time. All right. Cheers. Enjoy. Enjoy.